the assassination attempt inevitably after that event happened the discourse was going to go crazy but the thing about these kind of events is and it doesn't have to be donald trump it could be literally anyone but i think he is a salient figure whenever there's an event like this particularly an assassination attempt successful or unsuccessful it immediately attracts conspiracy theorists of every stripe from left and right and the facts as they exist at the minute was that there was a lone shooter on a rooftop who managed to get up you know via some slip up in the security perimeter and and shot at trump and then was shot by snipers and killed right and mm-hmm. and that's it but the issue is that place that he was shooting from looks to be a very obvious potential site for somebody to like position them as a sniper especially in hindsight so the immediate reaction of people is how could that be possible the secret service you know, they're well-trained and professional, so that kind of thing shouldn't be possible unless there's something else mm-hmm. afoot, right? And so you have, like, for example, just to show the distribution, you have John Cusack, you know, the actor, left-wing mm-hmm. liberal guy, saying, I hate conspiracy theories because they avoid the open conspiracies we see with our eyes for rabbit hole nonsense. That said, it's unthinkable that the Secret Service doesn't cover the one roof staring at the stage. Zero chance. Also, no Secret Service action in history lets the candidate stop for a photo op. They cover the body and move it off site about as fast and completely as possible to imagine. See Reagan assassination attempt. Makes zero sense. Right, so from this angle, this is him saying it was a staged event in order to mm. increase support for Trump. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how unlikely it is that uh, that the Secret Service wouldn't have people stationed on that roof and I don't know how unlikely it is they would let Trump stand up and raise his fist or whatever. I don't know about any of that. But the problem with that story is that that was a real bullet, right, that was fired, <laughs> that they clipped his ear. Well, there was somebody else killed. Killed, yeah. Like, and yeah. there is no way that if your intention was to big Trump up that your strategy would be to fire a bullet that would take <laughs> off his ear nobody nobody is that good a shot <laughs> so yeah there's some problems with that one yeah so the story there does not make sense and brett weinstein wanted to make clear that that is the conspiracy theory that he would endorse so he responded to these events saying if you wish that the assassin had killed president trump your values are indefensible If you think that Trump's team might have orchestrated this, your ability to reason has failed you. Then he followed this up, just to clarify, because he got responses from his audience. I don't know why this tweet confused people. I'm not discounting the possibility that there was more to the attempt on (laughs) President Trump's life than meets the eye. I think that is highly likely. But I find the idea that Trump's team staged this impossible to imagine. So Brett, Brett wanted yeah. to say... Yeah, he's down with conspiratorial thinking. Make no mistake. <laughs> there's yeah. there's going to be something more going on. But not not one that makes the Republicans out to be the bad guys, right? That's, no. That, he's not into that one. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And Chris Williamson had on the retired MMA fighter and ex-military, might even be back in the military guy, Tim Kennedy. This is a guy who hosted a series to find Hitler, the living Hitler, because, I of see. course, he's, he's not yeah. actually dead right let me guess he's wearing a panama hat in venezuela yeah quite possibly so tim kennedy is a bit of a conspiratorial fool right but somebody with military credentials and in his take it was he had a little venn diagram and they all of them john cusack brett weinstein and tim kennedy all of them start out by saying look i'm not uh you know like these stupid conspiracy theorists who just immediately come out with the most harebrained Theories. No, it wasn't a conspiracy theory. But then as they go on, they essentially outline that they are conspiracy theories <laughs> and they have a conspiracy. It's just that they want the theories in more complex terms. So in his case, he drew three band diagrams, one saying lone shooter, the other saying enemy of Trump, and the other saying an inside job, right? These are all possibilities. It could be like a lone shooter who is, you know, just uh, taking action on his own, could be enemies of Trump within the government to, you know, give him a crap security detail and in the Mm -hmm. hope that somebody could penetrate it. Or it could be an inside job where it was actually 
people in his own network that you know wanted to take him out and he drew the three Venn diagrams then basically said in his reading it's like in the middle of all of these all of those are it's the the intersection of all of them it's all three yeah and he linked it to the dei agenda dei agenda as well so but how does that make sense logically so how can it be a lone gunman and someone who's been i'm glad you asked my so it's like this you know, the government has been taken over. The deep state is in, a, in effect and there's like the corrupt DEI initiatives and all this. So they have instilled these values that are producing like limp wristed secret service people, women in the high positions who aren't big enough to protect Trump, all this kind of thing, right? So that's mm-hmm. the ideology. And then they won't extend the best protection to Trump. You know, they're... The Biden administration is sending not their best. They're they're refusing to give protection to RFK Jr. that he deserves and all this in the hope that something might take place. And then because of the rhetoric around Trump being Hitler, they are motivating lone shooters to take action. So they've made this perfect cocktail of an incompetent security apparatus plus the motivation to kill Trump. Mm. So it's kind of like all of them are coming together in the perfect storm to enable. But that's not a conspiracy theory. That is just mm. an that's acknowledging logic. the facts. Yeah, I guess the, the common denominator with these conspiracy theories is, is how much weight is placed on those prior assumptions that, that are built into them. You know, there's like an agenda to create weak and ineffectual security agents. You know, like here he would, place a huge amount of weight on that and you add all those things up and and people build themselves into a situation where to them their conspiracy theory is kind of the only logical or at least the most probable explanation for events so that that they never believe they're doing in a conspiracy theory but because they they just weight everything wrong don't they yeah i'm going to give a bit more illustration of this because brett and heller released an episode of the dark horse their 234th episode, Matt. They've got a lot of episodes. And the Cave of Mirrors was the name of it, right? It's talking about the assassination attempt and their ideas around it. And it's very classic, Brett and Heller, but it also speaks to all this confluence of conspiratorial reasoning that we just talked about. And I've got a couple of clips. The first one is just to remind you how good Brett and Heller are at doing the kind of scientific, rigorous figure cosplay, right? As they advance their conspiracy hypothesis. So listen to this. The argument is if we look at the history of assassinations, especially uh, assassinations of American presidents and presidential candidates, that there is a pattern that is evident, which is most assassinations are the work of lone gun nuts. And therefore, we should be very reluctant to look beyond that unless there's reason to, unless there's evidence to. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, logically speaking, that makes sense, but it, uh, it runs afoul of a higher logic, which I want to make evident. So the higher logic is this, and forgive the the academic uh, uh, detour, but there are two kinds of error that we discuss in uh, in science. One is called random error, that's just noise, and the other is called systematic error. And while it sounds like in some ways systematic error would be better because it's organized, um, in fact, it is way worse. Random error is error that goes in an arbitrary direction. So sometimes a data point will push you towards a hypothesis you're trying to test when your hypothesis isn't even true. So this all sounds like a preamble, Chris, for this little little detour to explain about random error and bias or systematic error. Um, systematic error. He's going to, mm-hmm. like, essentially they're responding to an article from Michael Shermer, which was pointing out that, like, most assassinations are done by lone figures Mm -hmm. right like and it it actually isn't conspiracies even though they're constantly alleged and they're arguing that that this is wrong (laughs) like because they're conspiracy theorists right so they want to say that that is assuming that the 
official account is actually correct, then that there's a systematic error, right? Because people are believing yeah. the official accounts. Yeah. So, yeah. but it, but it's that you know that thing about okay, let me talk about these academic terms that we have called you know systematic and random error, and these are important concepts, and it. You know, it just gives the yeah. impression that they're approaching this very like careful scientists. Yeah, I mean, firstly, it's an extremely like I know what he's saying, right? He's saying that the data that you think you have about mm. most shootings being the work of crazy lone gunmen, that data is wrong. So you're you're operating from the wrong assumption. Actually, that data is perturbed towards that, whereas actually they they weren't. <laughs> mostly lone gunmen, right? So it's a very loose analogy to, to map systematic error and random random error statistical concepts to what he's saying, which is basically that you can't trust anything that yeah, the official yeah. story is telling you. And that's it, that's just a straight up conspiratorial that's claim. Saying. That's all he's saying, right? So he's saying yeah. that. He's saying that, which is bog standard conspiratorial claim without any evidence. But the little preamble, the little sidetrack into statistical terminology there, it's it's just window dressing, isn't it? Yeah, but it gives a certain impression and it takes them literal hours to get to the main conspiracy <laughs> in this. And they cover lots of mini conspiracies before they get there. But it it's actually like two hours in before they get to their final conspiracy. <laughs> and there's so many sidetracks about yeah. like various things, including that they knew Jack Black at school and yeah. what he was like, and also, you know, various scientific sidetracks and whatnot. But, but Chris, this is a recurring theme, right? Remember we noticed this with Jordan Peterson early on, for instance, where yeah. you get asked a direct question and then we'll embark on this monologue and visit yeah. all of these different places. It's all very obscure. It's all very dense. The connections between points are really long. And if you're trying to follow along, you cannot help but lose the thread at multiple points between the time that he starts his answer and the time that he finishes his answer. And I think we agreed that that kind of style is is a feature, not a bug, for, as far as these, yeah. these people are concerned, because it's actually quite helpful, right? After that two-hour-long preamble before they, they claim the silly thing, it serves to give the impression that they've built up some form yeah. of argument some mountain of evidence yes i know i know it, it, it does and it's also like the famous clip that we always play is brett talking about how he isn't a conspiracy theorist he advances conspiracy hypotheses right and he, he loves to use this to argue that like actually it's been a good scientist to entertain various hypotheses right so here's a bit more about this and also you'll hear some of the dynamics about like flattering the audience so listen to this but the question of how we're going to deal with what appears to have happened what it might mean beyond the obvious is not straightforward and what i what i think what i think our audience expects from us and what we can do is we can model the very difficult question of how you responsibly engage in evaluating circumstances like this where very few of us were present uh, the information that we have is filtered both intentionally uh, and accidentally by algorithms and things like that how are we to reason through what you know what are the what are the bounds of what we are allowed to consider here and what are the what is the uh, the appropriate toolkit to bring to bear mm -hmm. does that sound fair enough you're asking, what are you asking me? Um, that, that, that's I'm sorry. A, <laughs> does that seem like a reasonable way to approach this? Sure. Okay. So first question I wanted to address, I saw a lot of unavoidable um, theorizing. That is the advancing of hypotheses is theorizing. You don't advance theories, you advance hypotheses. So mm -hmm. an awful lot of theorizing about possible conspiracies that might go beyond the obvious in the case of the attempt on President Trump's life. I was surprised by the sloppiness of some of it. God, this is just so much waffle and window dressing, right? You know, we advance hypotheses. We don't advance theories. This is an important thing. I, I said this to my 
students all the time. These are important scientific principles we know. He's just, <laughs> just saying words. Yeah, he's just conspiracy theorizing. But he wants to say that there are stupid conspiracy theories, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and there's, and then there is what he's about <laughs> to, to, to do. <laughs> but all that preamble as well, like, I think our audience has come to expect mm-hmm. that we will carefully evaluate mm-hmm. this and, you know, and talk about algorithms and intentional and accidental yeah. filtering of information it's yeah that's right we have to think carefully about what's the most responsible way to engage in uh, in speculation and hypothesizing given that we're working with incomplete information all is not apparent mm. so but let's proceed let's proceed responsibly yeah let's, let's proceed i did like as well that heller's response in the middle of it was is when what? he like set her up <laughs> to agree she was like what? <laughs> then, yeah. Oh yeah, I, sure. Yeah, that's. A- <laughs> I really like that. I really like the idea that she's just kind of tuning out while he does these things. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Just having a bit of a yeah. mental break, which I would do if I was yeah. sitting there next to him. But lest you think that Heller is epistemically better and you know more well grounded, let's hear her talk a little bit about you know the kind of logic that she brings to bear here. Some of you know the epistemic tools she has in her toolbox. You know, Michael Shermer in his piece that 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 you showed briefly, um, arguing that lone gun nuts are are the expected, all lead to this supposition that most moderns are walking around with, which is that the null hypothesis is it was one guy. The null is that it was one guy imagining anything else that takes special evidence, and you're going to have to prove it. If the null hypothesis, if the default hypothesis is it was one guy because of Hanlon's razor, because of Occam's razor, because of parsimony, because of all of these things, then in order to uh, credibly propose that it was anything more than one guy, the burden is on you. And I think we're part of where we have we have gotten in thinking about this is actually under conditions as complex as this. There is no null that you that you you cannot to and so it, it will sound if you if if you start down this road it's like nope I don't think the null should be lone gun nut oh you're a freaking conspiracy theorist conspiracy hypothesist uh, and oh so you think the null should be conspiracy no I think there shouldn't be a null here yeah I, I, I think I think that what we need to go in with is we don't know we are open and uh, there are so many observations here of maybe incompetence across every domain across every every possibility and maybe not but the null is not one therefore I have to work harder to prove conspiracy the null is we don't know that, that was some fun that was fun reasoning thank you for playing that Chris I, I enjoyed that I mean Again, with the scientific language, right? No hypotheses and alternative Hamlin's razor. Alternative yeah. hypotheses. And what she's saying is don't assume that it's one explanation or the other as a default and just and rather have an open Everything mind. is equally plausible, yeah. which is a stupid. It, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not true. I mean, like, let's take a different example, right? The police, the police turn up at someone's house. And there's a, a woman lying unconscious on the floor or has been murdered or something like that, or a man, whatever. And they are going to do things like interview family members, right? They're going to do other things as well. That's not, that's not saying that they assume that it's going to be someone else who's living in the house, but it often is, right? And it, it's not that they're like discounting any other options. It's just normal investigation where they where you where you gather evidence. I don't think that anyone investigating and you know, the secret services and so on, the security services would be investigating everything about the background of this guy, every little detail, right. everything, right? They're not they're, they're not starting off with a, with a firm, like, null hypothesis that they have to get shifted from. This is, again, a totally, like, it's partly just window dressing to sort of use all these scientific terms like null hypothesis and oh, yeah. hypothesis and so on. It's mostly that. But it's also, like, it injects a version of reality, which isn't true, right? They don't, they actually don't operate like that at all when they're investigating crimes. No, but they are correct in the sense that, like, the default approach to this is that there was a guy on a rooftop that there's video of, right, who shot at 
Trump and appears to be like a 20 year old guy, right? Yeah, like that's and, that's like evidence that is known, right? Like, but, but yeah, before, that's evidence. So, but before you commence your investigation, right, you've got the fact, you know, the immediate reports to the ground, you might start off with some facts that are known, right? That you, you know, you might know the guy, you might, because you've got his body, you might have identified yeah. them, you might have the gun, etc. And you proceed from there. Yeah, now you're going to check how, like, what was he doing? Who was he in contact with? Did he write down about this plan? All that kind of thing will be investigated, right? So it's not going to be ruled out that there was a larger conspiracy, that the person had help or that there was nobody else involved. But it is also more likely, given the history of various presidential assassins and whatnot, that it will be an unhinged person, right? So their notion is that, one, you're right, that like they're kind of suggesting there won't be a consideration of past alternatives, which there will be. But they're also, when they say that like it's silly to apply any weighting of plausibilities to possible explanations... Yeah, it's just not how it works. Like, like, let's say hypothetically, they looked into the all of the background of this person, everyone they'd met with, phone call records, you know, I'm sure there's like a dozen of different ways they can check every single thing. And let's say they find no, no contacts with suspicious things, no record of meeting dodgy people, no involvement with any political organizations, yada, yada, yada. Then they would probably default to this person's bit nuts right and and crazy yeah. like, whereas i think like heather is implying that what they should be doing is saying if they didn't find any evidence of that well they didn't find any evidence that he didn't do that d- like wasn't like it's absolutely like this, the dog that didn't bark at the nighttime or something then you just have yeah. to keep you have to keep all those options as equally uh, likely it's not- yeah it could like there's no actual clear evidence that it wasn't aliens involved in that right hmm. that has not been disproven yeah, and so it would be wrong to discount that out of hand because, yes, it's unlikely, right? But yeah. aliens presumably would be good at hiding yeah. their involvement, right? And, like, it's the, it's the same logic. It's as, it's as <laughs> good as that logic, but it's just, yeah. The, the other thing too, Chris, is that, of course, this hypothetical scenario where there's no evidence of anything if, either way, right? Absolutely yeah. none. That That never happens. Right when when they look at these people, they find like deranged Facebook posts, and they find weird things, or they they have reports from family or friends. There was a bit of a loner and and seemed out of sorts. You know what I mean? Like or there's- or there's this issue where when somebody engages in something like this, that there's an assumption that like they are unusual in some respect because most of us don't go around and like try to assassinate people, right? But it can be that somebody has an entirely coherent thought process and did a uh, a kind of cost benefit analysis and decided this is the appropriate cause of action and that can happen in the case of like people that are white supremacist shooters targeting mosques or whatever like that they're not mentally ill in the sense that they've got no idea about the consequences or whatever no. they simply have decided their ideology means this is the correct course of action. So yes. that could be the case as well, right? Yeah, like, yeah exactly. It, it, but uh, I agree with you. But to, to return to Heather and Brett, I mean, I think it was good you played that because it, it parallels what Brett did before about his epistemic approach and that it's just like he was bringing in these stats concepts to, to spruce up a bog standard rationale for being a conspiracist. Heather here is bringing in this stuff about null hypotheses and and so on yeah to 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 really just she's trying to say we should keep an open mind about yeah yeah like it's like okay yeah or yeah but even to be charitable keep an open mind when you're investigating these things about the cause or the motivation behind the person doing the thing that's like that's fine you know what i mean like that's that's a trivial that's a trivial yeah yeah but they don't mean that because like, as Brett said in his tweet, he wants to rule out any well, possibility for, you know, like, as you pointed out, there's problems with the logic there. But if they were consistent, they would be saying, you know, that you shouldn't be ruling out the possibility of this being a staged event, like for Trump. But there is lots of reasons that you should rule that out. And they rule that out as well, for the various reasons, you know, that what they just don't want to rule out is a plot by the deep mm. state against Trump. Like yeah. you know, yeah. combined, combined with yeah. combined with DEI, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, they don't want to rule that. Yeah, out. Uh, well, it's just annoying to me that the that the 
argument is based on these faulty premises like the people investigating assassinations, not just this one, but all of them, have this inherent reluctance to accept any explanation that isn't a lone gunman explanation. Yeah. And I just don't yeah. think that's true. No, they're going to like they're going to check as well that the security breaches that allowed this to happen. Is there any evidence of like foul play or intentional or is it incompetence? Like that will absolutely be looked yeah. into in yeah. some detail. So for, for, for very legitimate reasons, right? Like they're not expecting that they're going to find some conspiracy to no. by insiders to murder Trump. But they're, what they are expecting is some flaw in their procedures and somebody maybe not doing their job 100% well. And they're, they're all about finding those things and fixing them. Yeah. So in any case, if you want to hear this logic applied to another topic, which sound, sound familiar... Listen to this. So it is perfectly natural at a logical level to not treat anything as the default hypothesis. I would point out we've been here before, right? The idea that natural origins for COVID was the obvious explanation and that, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology it required some incredible level of evidence that we couldn't possibly have, mm -hmm. right? The answer is there was no evidence that it was a natural origins. And there was a an institute studying these very viruses in that very location. So nothing has priority, yeah, right? And in fact, you know, to the extent that the natural origins people believe that actually the case is closed in their direction you haven't brought forth any evidence you're depending entirely on presumption presumption which you are not logically entitled to uh, it's just so wrong isn't it like it's it's this um pretense that there's no such thing as prior probabilities like i haven't had a cancer test recently on the balance of prior probabilities i probably don't i could have cancer so you don't exist in a context of perfect ignorance where until you get the positive or the negative definitive cancer test that you can make no assumptions about what is likely, right? It's, yeah. There is prior probabilities. There is. That's how people operate. But, well, but in, even in that case, like, you know, in the case of the lab, like the way Brett presents it is that it was, abs you know, this is just a very formulaic <laughs> regurgitation of lab like people now, but that there was no consideration given of the plausibility of a lab origin initially, uh, which isn't true. There was, and and then he, you know, states that they they haven't presided any evidence. They've just presumed it, and that again is the exact opposite. What has happened is the amount of evidence has continued to build up, which has continued to support the natural origin case, yeah. and scientists have adjusted their level of confidence accordingly. And at the beginning, when they find some evidence that was leaning towards natural origin they very carefully included caveats saying there might yeah. if future evidence comes that points the other way you know this could this could shift be revised the balance. yeah yeah the other way they did say that and, the, and they and they sent investigations to china and they were you know doing things to look at the origins michael warbay was initially like more skeptical of the chinese researchers and all of this so like it's uh Again, it's just not an accurate representation. Well, it's the same pattern as before, right? The, the scientific lingo that gets used is really an invitation to draw the listener in to basically accept their false premises that they've built in there. Yeah. So the false premise that they've built in once again is that any of the scientists investigating the origins of COVID had this really strong assumption based on the prior presupposition that virtually all viruses are natural in origin and that was their guiding thing and that they would they would require so much evidence like an inconceivable amount of evidence to, to be pulled away from that default explanation that's the perspective that conspiracists want you to believe about anyone who doesn't buy into their thing but it's just not true like scientists just like police investigators or security services are quite willing to be surprised you know even if it's likely that it was just domestic violence or it was just uh you know a, a lone gunman or it was just a natural origin of a virus the investigators are going in there and checking because they're generally you know what i mean like their job is, is to find the exceptional cases to, to find the new things that's the thing that motivates researchers certainly like nobody says i want to be a researcher so I can confirm that nothing is different and everything's always the same and nothing there's nothing new under the sun. That's not that's not a motivation of anyone that's doing research, right? You're trying to find new things. I know. And also just to mention as well, like Brett 
fairly early on estimated that it was 95% likely to be a lab leak, right? When he made his little, like, probability <laughs> chart of possibilities. So he is perfectly confident assigning huge probabilities, you know, in different circumstances. So none of it is consistent. Like, they're always, you know, just using whatever in the given moment is convenient for their argument. But it's that notion that they are being carefully scientific because they don't rule anything out. They treat everything mm. as equally plausible. And then they wait for the evidence to come in and adjust it. And like, no, no, that isn't what they do because we've constantly seen them take extremely strong stances, stances which are counter to the vast amount of evidence, right? On ivermectin, on the vaccines, on any number of topics. So yeah, it, this was just another illustration that they like to present it as, we're doing this careful, rigorous analysis. And that's what allowed us to like work out that it was a lab leak early. And the evidence doesn't support that. And that's not what yeah. they did. They just did the same kind of reasoning that they're displaying now, which is conspiratorial reasoning dressed up. And it's like a fucking you know cartoon <laughs> where the people are standing up on three kids standing on each other's shoulders in a like adult in costume. A trench coat. He's not a real scientist. If you make your logical possibility graph or your Venn diagrams, I suppose. Yeah. Then um yeah, just be wary out there. People that use this language and and those strategic caveats and all that stuff. Because they're kind of most of them do it now. I mean, you do have the kind of ranting and raving Alex Jones style conspiracy. And we're gonna but, get to him. But but <laughs> most of them frame it in quite you know they they go through the motions of being extraordinarily careful and rigorous yeah you know my galileo gambit we've talked about and there's there's all the tropes that come up very often in you know secular guru discourse but conspiracy communities too a new one i want to add is plato's cave Plato's Cave, I keep hearing it. <laughs> it's really rapping. popular. Really popular. Yeah, it's really hot right now. Plato's <laughs> Cave is so hot right now. And I swear to God, it's a red flag now. It's a, it is a red flag to hear yeah. it. It's like if someone on Twitter says Bayesian. Unfortunately, it's... Uh, yeah, exactly the same. <laughs> so here's Plato's Cave being deployed for bog standard Trump apologetics. Um, poor old Plato. Absolutely. Um, but... The idea that you've got a person who's itching to be dictator, um, that, you know, uh, but, it, he, but is that, it, he, does it he, hinge on like a couple of these like yeah. tropes that they, know, they pulled out of things that he said, and he's scary and mean and bad. And, and is it a couple of these things or like, <sighs> well, remember what a human being is, right? We need Plato's allegory of the cave. And yes, we keep rewriting it in the Matrix and yeah. the Truman Show and all of these things revive that metaphor for a reason. You've got a cave wall. It's high def. And it feeds a series of beliefs that are then repeated and discussed as if they make sense. And... Um, if you're not looking away, if you're not looking for reason, if you're not looking at that thing and going up to it and scratching it and discovering it's a cave wall, if that's reality, then you don't understand that uh, a game has been played with January 6th. You don't understand that there's something about uh, the idea, you know, that President Trump being asked what I believe was a trick question about his willingness to commit to a peaceful transfer of power has been transmuted into he refused to peacefully transfer power. Right. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's remind people, the allegory of Plato's Cave is, is actually about something called like forms. I'm going to massacre this. But in broad brushstrokes, the ancients liked the idea of there being not just like things that look like triangles, things that were approximately a triangle. They felt that there were like real, that there was like a perfect triangle that had the essence of triangleness. And and even though you, there wasn't any one of them perfectly out there in the world, it existed in some sort of philosophical, metaphysical realm, right? So these, these are called forms, right? So you could have one for triangle, you could have one for donkey, who knows? But that's the idea. But of course, you know, it's just a, it's an allegory, right? It's a story. It's, it's a bit of imagery. So you can use it 
to really make any point you like. In this case, the conspiratorial one where the things that you see, the story that's, that's playing out in front of you is just like a shadow play and, and really there's people behind the scenes and, and you're not being in touch with reality. So it's like the extraordinarily basic bitch conspiratorial concept that don't believe what's in front of your eyes, right? That, that the truth is out there, it's deeper. I mean, but just, you know, they usually reach for science stuff. Sometimes they reach for philosophy. I mean, this is all designed to flutter midwits, isn't it? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing smart people talk about null hypotheses and at the Plato's cave and stuff, and I'm, and I'm getting my nice conspiratorial juice at the same time. And what's it been applied to? The January 6th insurrection and Trump not committing to a peaceful transfer of power and, and Brett implying that these are all, you know, like media creations that that they're not what they seem to be like. It was a trick, right, that Trump apparently wouldn't commit to a trans... No, he actually wouldn't. It's not a trick. It's very well documented now for the legal cases that he actually had a scheme, like a, a very silly scheme, but an intentional scheme to like have fake electors who would be kind of sworn in by Pence and would switch the results so that he could be elected. And this was what the January 6th riots were based on and stuff. But that has actually only become stronger, the evidence that that was actually a, a plot. And also Trump has consistently refused to say that he will accept any election outcome that he doesn't win, right? Like he, he mm. says it quite clearly in interviews, but Brad is presenting that it like it's a media narrative that he, yeah. you know, it's, it's being like, portrayed as and, being and, unwilling to. And, and, and Heather's going. So what's what's the explanation for this fantasy that that liberals have yeah. about this? Is it just because Orange Man bad? Like why why are they imagining this? It's, it's, I mean, it is. Leto's cave. It's Leto's cave. That's right. It's so annoying to have this um, scientism, techno jargon, and philosophy sort of injected yeah. into what is basically just a conspiratorial, alternative, highly political, like ideologically driven view of the world, <laughs> a little alternate reality for people to inhabit. Uh, so It's so frustrating. The last clip, Matt, the last clip, which is the end of their conspiracy theorizing, which comes, you know, after two hours of like build up to this, right? And it doesn't actually, they don't dwell on it very long. Kind of after this, they immediately wrap up with a poem. I'll just play you where this eventually leads to, right? And there's longer bits. There's kind of like, you know, other conspiracies that we've in, but, but let's see if this was the scientific epistemically you know, rigorous assessment that was promised. I knew it was going to be, there's this belief sure. that deep state is um, the vast bureaucratic apparatus that does not turn over with every administration. That is indeed a very important phenomenon. It wields real power. It's not what somebody like Trump means when he talks about the deep state. He's talking about something that is, involves the intelligence community, um, the military industrial complex. It obviously has international connections through things like the five eyes. We can debate whether it exists, but the point is it's, it's a different thing. Now, to the extent that there is a deep state that involves the intelligence apparatus. We know from history, because it has been exposed, that the intelligence apparatus has investigated mind control using things like hallucinogenic drugs. The MK Ultra project was about mind control. So when you have a lone gun nut, is that all you've got? Well, that rather depends. Is, are they downstream of somebody's project to control minds? Did somebody steer them this way or not? And, you know, steering them that way wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily know that they were even working for somebody, right? If there was such a project. Project Mockingbird. That was a project to control the press, right? Now, these things were officially disbanded, but what does that even mean? You're talking about clandestine organizations that disbanded programs that embarrassed them. Did they rename them? Did, are the programs really gone? Do those programs have descendants that we don't know the names of? We don't know. And so anyway, the sum total of all of that is we have a, we have a failure for events to add up. Those add, 
those events have profound consequences for how we are governed governed that affect who will be winners and who will be losers. In a nutshell, he's saying the conspiracy theory that, that is reasonable, that is not the one that somebody who wants to impugn MAGA and Trump might hold, is that this was mind control, like an MK Ultra type thing. This person has been activated, activated, clockwork orange. It's a Manchurian candidate scenario. You know, that's a possibility that we should absolutely be considering. And they've also got control of the media apparatus. He's always, Brett is always hinting that this could be it, but this is just an illustration. He's not saying that that is necessarily true, right? He's just hypothesizing, but like, so this big, huge buildup about, you know, be careful with your epistemic reasoning and stuff. It was to talk about <laughs> mind control and the media <laughs> all being, you know, utilized by the deep state and the military industrial complex. And we can talk about the different versions that is now, but obviously something yeah. is afraid. So like, it's just absolute bog standard conspiratorial yeah. guff, right? There is nothing deep or scientific or anything to that. It's just Brett saying all the usual waffle and using the exact same terms about, you know, MK Ultra and, yeah. and referencing clandestine programs and whatnot. And and this is what all that <laughs> scientific babble was. At the beginning was about. Of. That's right. It was all <laughs> a preamble to this punchline at the very end that they took like about 30 seconds, and then they went straight to reading a poem. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not really about the conspiracy theory, right? Like, yes, I mean, so supposedly the topic was all about him introducing, introducing his reasonable science-based conspiracy theory and that it was a Manchurian candidate mind control situation. But that's not really the point, is it, Chris? Because they spent two hours building up to it. Like, it feels like the point is the process. Yeah, but in the process, they outline a whole bunch of other conspiracy theories about various features. And it's all just basically hovering around whatever is in the discourse. You know, mm. like whatever was kind of the big news on Twitter or Fox News or whatever, they'll like weave it in. Like, yeah. like I said, Jack Black comes up because... Tenacious D, the Kyle Gass said something about the Trump assassination. So they have a an aside about that. But it is a whole bunch of different conspiracy theories weaved in and a constant refrain that they are yeah. carefully considering the information and they're looking at it. And it, it's just that, that bit at the end, once they get longer in, they're more willing to say stuff like this, right? Yeah. And this is... The bit that usually people don't cite, you yeah. know, they will cite Brett earlier talking about the, you know, various epistemic hygiene applications that he has and yeah. all that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I guess it has to be that way because there's not really much more you could say about that. I mean, basically, Brett's got this thought popped into his head that maybe it was mind control. So, so, we, so, we, so it could be a targeted assassination, even if there's no evidence to the contrary. But that ramps it back in, right? Because like at the start when they're saying everything is equally possible. So even if all the evidence supported that this guy was a lone shooter who appears to have activate, you know, acted independently, it doesn't matter doesn't matter because it could be mind control. Yeah, it's it's like that guy on the Discovery Channel. Is it? So what you're saying is it, it could be aliens. I'm it, not saying. I'm not it, saying it, 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 it could it be aliens. It was aliens. <laughs> but it, yeah, yeah. So it's just a reminder that that's what they are. I mean, this is what Eric does as well. The Weinsteins are best understood as partisan conspiracy theories. That's what they are. And their particular brand of conspiracy theorizing is one cloaked in the garb of like science and academic rigor and that kind of thing. But it's lacking all of those actual features. It is purely self-serving and flattering rhetoric for their audience that hmm. that's yeah. what they're doing. But yeah. they're very good at it. They're very, they're very good. good at it. Yeah, I agree. It's pure performance, but um, they are good at it. And it burns my soul, Chris. Uh, but thank you for sharing it with me. There is, Matt, just one last clip with from Brett that I have to play for you. One last clip. Okay. Hey, folks, Dr. Brett Weinstein here. After the attempt on President Trump's life on Saturday, I did a fair amount of thinking. A number of things had become apparent. First, if President Trump had not turned his head at the exact moment he did, we would likely be living in a very different world today. President Trump dodged a bullet, and so did the republic. 
Irrespective of the ultimate explanation for the attempt on President Trump's life, it is quite clear that denying adequate Secret Service protection to President Trump and denying any protection at all to Bobby Kennedy is tantamount to the inhabitants of the executive branch inviting the murder of their political opponents. That would be a shocking assertion if we had also not seen the ruthless weaponization of the courts and the abridgment of First Amendment rights, all in an effort to avoid a free and fair election. We are somewhere very dire, and the Republic needs us to do extraordinary things. Our great nation needs to heal. We have been divided against each other. Our institutions have been weaponized against the public. Our universities peddle radical nonsense. Our newspapers bend over backwards to avoid reporting the news. Our tax dollars are poured into holes carved in the universe for reasons that are never explained. These problems are dire. They are going to require solutions that are beyond what any one man can deliver. What we need to do is unrig our system and refound the republic. President Trump, the country needs you to join forces with Bobby Kennedy and name him as your vice presidential running mate. And Bobby, the country needs you to accept. If you see the wisdom in this, you'll realize it solves a number of problems. Maybe most importantly, it creates a kind of assassination insurance. If you run independently and they take you out, they solve a problem from their perspective. If you run together, they only make their problems worse. Our nation suffered a great trauma in 1963 and another in 1968. That pattern threatened to repeat itself this last Saturday. It is hyperpartisan, isn't it? I mean, yes, it's conspiratorial. Yes, mostly what they do is self-promotion and self-aggrandizement. But uh, it is all geared towards a certain faction, I guess, in anti-institutional, modern MAGA politics. That's what Brett's about. Yeah, because it's not a free and fair election. It's all about, you know, suppressing the will of the people and... and it's tantamount to trying to kill them. And I notice it's built in the assumption that they are, they are trying to assassinate one of you or both of you. They. They. Yeah. yeah. The capital, yeah they, capital but they T, is they. quite clearly the, the, the executive branch, right? As Biden, <laughs> right? The Democrats. But the beautiful thing is like every election cycle, Brett has a scheme to see if the Republic, right? He yeah, had he his Unity 2020 <laughs> where he wanted to elect Dan Crenshaw and Tulsi Gabbard, right? That was his, his scheme, even though he didn't have any electoral access. And he got, you know, media coverage on Tucker Carlson and whatnot about that. But in this case, his Unity 2024 pitch was RFK Jr. and Trump unite, like select him as your vice president. And on the same day that he released this video, Trump announced J.D. Vance was his vice <laughs> presidential pick. <laughs> so it's, it's just Brett's consistent average of like grandiose proclamations big plans i love how he jumps on every election like like clockwork i mean they jump on every everything that's in the news. Everything. everything yeah ukraine most notably covid but yeah they're just constantly looking for the next thing to get attention to yeah. but, but it is just very funny that brett's <laughs> next <laughs> scheme was defeated near <laughs> ours <laughs> moink that's a smidgen of moo and a bit of oink or and can I just read you one response, Matt, underneath it, which I think sums up this whole ecosystem and who they appeal to. Somebody responded on Twitter, even though I can't say I agree with your pick, I love the demeanor. This is how civil humans communicate meaningfully. Props. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. civility porn. That's civility <laughs> porn. Right there. Even even though Brett is saying what he's saying is not civil, he's saying that the you know it it does include this lofty rhetoric about how we need to unite, but it's essentially saying that the Biden administration is responsible for the assassination attempt. It's been trying to take out RFK mm. Jr. and now the like MAGA right and the anti-vaccine independent libertarian wing. Yeah. need to come together to unite to take back the country from whatever undemocratic forces seized it. Yeah. That's very much not a message. No, of it's not unity. a civil message. It's a hyper-partisan. <laughs> yeah, I think th this is why they're potentially so much more powerful than the Alex Joneses of the world because they have 
the trappings of civility, of reasonableness, of authority, yeah. that gravitas, the, the fireside chats and so on. And, and a lot of the people, like the, the person that replied there on Twitter, that's what they go on. Yeah. They go on the uh, superficial uh, presentations. So, um, yeah. Also, also in that episode, Brett declares about, you know, talks about himself being a registered Democrat and all this and how his criticism is, you know, as a left leaning person and whatnot. And like Brett has been a a raving right wing contrarian (laughs) for (laughs) a a fair amount of time now. Yeah, that's right. As a staunch Democrat and liberal and voter for Clinton (laughs) and stuff like that, I just wish they'd stop drinking the adrenochrome. That's all I'm asking (laughs) for the sake of the country. Well, that was Brett. That was Brett. Thanks, Chris. (laughs) Thanks, Chris. This brightened my day.